The Gospel reading today is one of the best known parables from Luke's Gospel. It's in chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? The lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbour as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, the lawyer asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down the road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while travelling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will pay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Here ends the reading. As a little boy, I was always fascinated by this parable. The story is clear and straightforward, and it stands alone as a great piece of storytelling. It's not surprising that so many stained glass artists have found in it a great subject for their art. But of course, it also stands as a wonderful exploration of what it means to be a neighbour. What intrigued me when I was young was why the Samaritan poured oil and wine on the wounds of the man who'd been beaten and robbed. I knew about oil for cooking and wine for drinking, so I struggled to understand what the good Samaritan was doing with his oil and wine. Years later, of course, I discovered that wine with its alcohol content is a good disinfectant and that oil was commonly used to seal or protect abrasions, much as we might use a Band-Aid or a larger elastoplast to keep a wound free from dirt and flies. Ironically, of course, I sometimes use olive leaf extract myself to boost my immune system during these winter, wintry months. But isn't this part of the genius of the parable? It challenges us with questions that are not always easy to answer. It juxtaposes the very familiar with the unexpected and the mysterious. These days, of course, I always want to look at context to understand a passage of scripture. And this parable is part of an exchange between Jesus and his critics about what it means to really keep the law, and particularly the law concerning care for neighbour. The lawyer is pushing Jesus to see if he can really explain who neighbour is when it comes to keeping the law. Jesus replies to tell this parable with all its surprising twists and turns. The priest, surely a man who knows and keeps the law, passes by on the other side of the road so that he doesn't have to deal with the half-dead man. The lawyer was probably not surprised by this. Priests and lawyers, even in ancient Palestine, were not always friends. The Levite is the descendant of the tribe of Levi. The role of the Levites was to take turns at assisting the priests, the Aaronic priesthood, who served in the temple. So a Levite, like a priest might be expected to know and keep the basic commands of the law. Levites themselves were not so closely aligned with the temple cult. Rather, they were servants to the Aaronic priests. They did manual work, controlled crowds, provided fire and animals for the sacrifices. 
I usually spend a few weeks in the temple on a sort of rota, assisting a priest in the temple. Biblical scholars and probably Jesus' contemporaries as well would have understood that this story was a proclamation of the hypocrisy which saw temple worship as more important than care for neighbour. This critical point ought not to be lost on those of us who love the liturgical activity in our churches, sometimes more than we love the people of God. It's not just first century lawyers, priests and Levites who are criticised implicitly in this parable. All of us who demonstrate dissonance between our words and actions are priests and Levites. The Samaritan, on the other hand, is not one of the chosen people of God. He's a heretic. The Gospels frequently identify Sumerians, Samaritans as outliers, people who cannot be trusted and who do not believe the truth revealed through the law of Moses. Think, for example, of the Samaritan woman at the well in the early chapters of St John's Gospel. When the Samaritan sees the beaten man, he was moved with pity. Why? As a Samaritan, he has no religious credentials at all. Why is Jesus telling a story where such a person seems to be a hero? Not only does the Samaritan care for the injured man, he dresses his wounds, places him on his own animal and brings him to an inn where he continues to care for the man. What's more, he leaves money with the innkeeper to pay for his ongoing care and promises to repay any extra costs associated with the injured man. So Jesus ends his outrageous story by asking a lawyer which of these three was neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers. The poor lawyer is forced to admit that it was the one who had mercy on him. Though he can't even bring himself to say the Samaritan, because of his inbuilt prejudice against the Samaritan people. This is a very tricky parable for us as well. And it's just not just for the religious power breakers of Jesus' day. It reveals that the actions of God are often seen in the very people that religious elites scorn. God doesn't always choose the same people to keep his law as to give life to his law is how the French novelist George Bernanos describes this uncomfortable reality. Time and time again, Jesus' teaching draws the clear delineation between religious hypocrisy and the humility of edge dwellers who know and understand the needs of people in trouble and who respond with mercy and justice. In our contemporary situation, we might call to mind the people of the Ukraine in their desperate plight and our reticence to get too involved. Even more powerfully, as NADOC week draws to a close, we might recall the dissonance between our longing for a just multicultural Australia and our slowness to respond to the call from the heart document issued from the First Nations meeting at Uluru five years ago. Even in our own towns and in the city of Ballarat, the disparity between the edge dwellers and the rest of the community is often a failure of engagement and an inability to share responsibly and justly our wealthy lives. The parable of the Good Samaritan is a great story. It's a rich parable, but mostly it's an uncomfortable call for us to examine our own hypocrisy and to search for new ways to be people of mercy and non-judgmental service. I want to finish by asking a couple of uncomfortable questions of my own. The man who fell among robbers has no name, and so can be every man. That's also true for the one who showed mercy. And the other protagonists in the story are also just types with no name. It's when we name ourselves and those around us that we engage in the recognition of real people. If you chose to rewrite this parable with names, what would they be? Who would you be in the parable? Priest, Levite, Samaritan, innkeeper? Perhaps we are all people who are like the one who fell among robbers. Let me pray the colleagues for 
the Sunday. Let us pray. Eternal God, you've taught us through Christ that love is the fulfilment of the law. Help us to love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and with all our strength, and to love our neighbour as ourselves. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the God of mercy and justice, bless you and those you love, today and always. Amen.